worship at Westminster and to our inclusive family of faith. We particularly welcome any visitors that are joining us this morning and those, of course, those of us that are joining us on YouTube. Our gospel reading this morning comes from Matthew 3, verses 13 through 17. Listen to this. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented Jesus saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way 
to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as He came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to Him and He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on Jesus. And a voice from heaven said, This is My Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. New year, new you. Has anyone seen or read that phrase about a thousand times this week? For many, the new year is an opportunity to make new habits, new resolutions, new promises. The treadmills at the gym swell with new crowds. And the chips are cleared out from the pantries as people look to reshape their selves and their worlds. It almost seems as though the world enters the new year by declaring that we are not good enough. That we should lose weight, buy new makeup, buy more, do more, be more. Be something other than who we are now. In many ways, it seems as though the world wants to sell us the gift of new life. And yet, by February or the fourth day of the new year, the treadmills will empty out and the chips and cookies will creep back into the pantries. The new resolutions will slip away and our new promises will be broken. For most of us, the transformation into this magical new you won't really happen. We'll continue to do the best we can while feeling like it is never good enough. It's like our pattern of worship. Every week we show up with the need to confess and the need to hear once more that God forgives us, God embraces us, God loves us, and that God offers us new life. Every week we show up And remember the promises that we haven't kept. Only to hear that God is faithful still. That God continues to keep God's promises like the promise of new life. We're kicking off the second Sunday in 2017 with a sermon series about God's promises. Rejoicing in God's continued faithfulness to us. And we start at the very beginning. The beginning of Jesus' public ministry as He is baptized and declared to be God's beloved Son in the waters of new life. And we start at our beginning as we remember the promises made at our own baptism. The promise of new life through the Holy Spirit. For those who follow the latest incarnation of Sherlock on PBS, I have to tell you that I giggled a little this week during the baptism scene. Sherlock Holmes stood in a small circle around a giant marble font as the male priest asked questions and talked about baptism and being a godparent. In true Sherlock fashion, he was texting throughout the whole baptism, And his disdain for the whole ritual was apparent. To be honest, the whole scene felt a little out of place for me since church attendance and God has not really been a part of this series. Why all of a sudden does a Christian ritual matter to John Watson? And we certainly know what arrogant Sherlock thinks of religion. As I watched that slightly cliche scene, it seemed such a far cry from Matthew's depiction of Jesus' baptism not in a pristine sanctuary with a marble font, but in the wilderness, in the River Jordan. Not with everyone dressed to impress, but crowds of people in need, coming as they are for a chance at redemption and repentance and new life. Not an empty ritual, but a powerful, heaven-rending moment filled with the Holy Spirit and the voice of God. As Matthew tells it, 
Jesus is baptized by his cousin John in the river, outside of the city and the center of power. John has been declaring a baptism for the repentance of sins, preparing the way in the desert for the one who was coming, who was greater than him. He has called the established religious leaders a brood of vipers. Things are going well. The word repentance here that John talks about comes from the Greek word metanoia. Metanoia is a great word for the new year and new beginnings as it is translated as turning around or transformation. John then is inviting people into the river to confess their sins, to experience a new beginning, a new opportunity, and a chance for new life. One unique feature in Matthew's version of this story is the conversation between John and Jesus. When Jesus asks John to baptize him, John at first refuses. Ever the truth teller, John wonders why him? Who was he to baptize Jesus? Shouldn't, in fact, Jesus be baptizing him? Even if John didn't completely understand the depth of Jesus' identity, he felt that in the eyes of Jesus, he wasn't enough. He wasn't worried. Maybe he was tracking his own faults in his head, wondering why this strange and fascinating and amazing man would choose him. Maybe he's wondering, what sins would Jesus have to confess? Why would Jesus need to enter the waters of new life? But rather than dwelling on the reasons why John wasn't the right one, Jesus instead encourages him with the same words that Mary speaks to the angel. Let it be. Jesus says that for John to baptize him will be righteousness. Indeed, Matthew will come back again and again to this word righteousness as Jesus teaches and leads his life as an example of higher righteousness. For Jesus, righteousness wasn't about being perfect or sinless, although he was. Righteousness wasn't about being better than someone else or looking down on other people. Instead, righteousness was about faithful obedience. Dr. Warren Carter, a professor at Bright Divinity School, explains this kind of righteousness that Jesus is talking about. Righteousness expresses actions that are consistent with or faithful to a relationship or commitment. God is righteous, for example, when God acts consistently with God's covenant commitment. To act faithfully, to act righteously, whether God or humans, is to act in accord with God's will. Jesus encourages John toward righteousness, toward obeying God's will for him to baptize Jesus. And Jesus is also acknowledging the righteousness that He Himself will fulfill. His willingness to obey God's will for His own life, death, and resurrection. The baptism of Jesus puts the forces of sin and death on notice. The bringer of new life is now here. Jesus wades into the waters side by side with humanity showing that the new life He brings is for anyone willing to stand in that water with Him. Jesus enters the waters of Metanoia, turning towards Jerusalem and beginning His public ministry. In the Acts passage that we heard Chad read this morning, as Peter sums up the incarnation of Jesus Christ, he begins with the baptism. For Jesus, baptism is not the end goal, but the beginning. The start of His ministry of teaching, healing, and working miracles. For Jesus, baptism is the public declaration of who He really is. 
fully human and yet also the Son of God, the Beloved, as the voice from heaven declares. He is the bridge that is bringing the new life from God into the world. New life as He heals the sick, proclaims good news to the poor, and declares God's kingdom has arrived. And finally, He brings new life for the whole world through the cross and the empty tomb. And it all started with the camel hair wearing, locust eating, wild prophet John, not worthy to tie Jesus' sandals. Have you ever been surprised by God's call in your life? Have you ever been surprised by what Jesus has asked you to do? It's not too hard for me to continue to imagine John's inner train of thought as Jesus approaches him. Who am I that God would promise me new life? Who am I that Jesus would choose to use me? Who am I to preach the Gospel, to teach Sunday school, to lead on session, to participate in Bible study, to start a first Sunday feast? Who am I in all my own unrighteousness? The one to point people to righteousness. Who am I to stand side by side with my Savior in the river of new life? Who am I that God would name me and claim me as a beloved child? I can't even keep my New Year's resolutions. How can I be a vessel for God's promises, for God's gift of new life? And yet God is faithful still. God keeps God's same promises. God sends the Holy Spirit to bring the constant bringer a new life time and time again. When we would languish in our self-made prisons of the old life, the Holy Spirit breaks us free so that we can fulfill God's will. When we would be paralyzed by self-doubt or failure, Jesus shows up to encourage us to claim that new life once more. For we are marked in our own baptism with the sign of the cross, a sign that is both a symbol of death and new life. For in our baptism, the old passes away and the new life reigns supreme, whether we feel it that day or not. That righteousness is born in us in that moment, Opportunities to follow God's will in our lives, to listen and learn from the righteousness of Jesus Christ. For Jesus Himself is the metanoia. He is the one who turns an ordinary river into a river of salvation and new life. He turns ordinary bread and wine into a meal of salvation and new life. He turns a motley crew of disciples into a church of millions that brings salvation and new life to the sick, the suffering, and broken around the world. He turns mud into medicine, fear into faith, weakness into strength, vulnerability into power, and death into new life. Jesus is the proof that God keeps God's promises. The promises that we find in Isaiah 42. I have called you in righteousness. I have given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. See, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. The old has gone and the new life has begun. And it's a new year, new you. Except that the new you was born at your baptism. You have already become who you were meant to be. You are enough. You are already a child of God named and claimed as beloved. Whether it was in the waters, in a moving river, or sprinkled at a font in the arms of a pastor, surrounded by your friends and family. And the promises made at your baptism are still the same promises God makes to you today. 
The offering of new life. A life that is filled up with love, mercy, and grace so it can be poured out into the world in desperate need for real transformation and righteousness. So let us claim that righteousness and live into God's promise of new life this new year. Let us claim new life where the world sees death, hope where the world sees despair, and worthiness even when we don't deserve it. Thanks be to God for the gift of new life that appears again and again. Amen. Yeah.